Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Computer History Museum, another packed house. It's great to see all of you tonight. My name is John Holler, and I'm the president and CEO of the museum. And on behalf of the trustees and the staff and all of our members, many of whom are here tonight, it's just a real pleasure to welcome you to tonight's event. Uh, I want to just talk about a couple of things that are going on at the museum before I begin the formal program. I mentioned uh, in December, for those of you who were here to hear Larry Lessig speak, that we are in the middle of celebrating the 50th anniversary of the invention of the integrated circuit. And that is, uh, sort of begins, that anniversary began last September, uh, which was the 50th anniversary of Jack Kilby in 1958. We have the planar process, which began 50 years ago uh, this summer. So we've sort of picked this intermediate point of the year of 2009 to uh, declare what we call a salute to the semiconductor. Now we've had a couple of events already uh, involving Richard Tedlow, one of our trustees who came and told a Harvard Business School case of the Intel 386 sole source decision. But uh, the really big event surrounding the uh, anniversary of the invention of the integrated circuit will happen in May. So. If you're interested, I'd really love for you to put down May 6th and May 8th as two important dates here at the museum because we're going to have a, a two-day symposium looking back first on May 6th of, uh, of uh, contemporaries of Jack Kilby who will be here to talk about everything that happened around uh, Kilby's initial work on the integrated circuit and then continuing on May 8th with a symposium about the growth of the semiconductor and the semiconductor industry here in Silicon Valley. Gordon Moore will be here as part of that panel. We're laying a uh, commemorative plaque at the side of the Fairchild offices over on San Antonio Road. We're opening a new temporary exhibit uh, in the uh, lobby of the museum. So there's a whole lot going on this year around the invention of the integrated circuit. It's a major celebration for us and uh, I very much like for all of you to be a part of that and that's, uh, that's going to be happening again in May and throughout the year. The second thing I want to mention, and many of you have heard about this, we are in the middle of doing the final planning stages for a major new permanent exhibit downstairs. It's in an area of the museum that you can't see. It's back behind the Babbage Engine and the Innovation in the Valley area. It'll be 30,000 square feet, and almost everything that you see, which is invisible storage downstairs now, plus a whole lot more from the museum's collection, is going to come out into this permanent exhibit. Uh, this has been years in the making, probably eight or nine years in the making. We're very excited that we're getting to the finishing stages on this. We'll be opening it uh, late next year, and it's going to be really a, a transformational event in the history of the museum. So all of you who, uh, who are at the museum frequently, who love the museum, who are members, I uh, just wanted to give you a little bit of a, of an, a sneak preview, I guess is probably the best way to put it, that that's coming up. So those are two things that are happening at the museum, and we're delighted that, uh, that you're here and you can be a part of it. So now I'd like to begin uh, tonight's formal program. When we were thinking about an event that we wanted to have along the lines of the event tonight, we thought about a panel discussion. We thought, boy, if we could get a highly accomplished engineer, a curious and creative scientist, a driven and proven entrepreneur, a pragmatic and successful investor, and a fiercely competitive, successful business executive with a record of building billion dollar companies, wouldn't that make a, a heck of a panel? And finally, we decided we could do that very thing by simply inviting Bob Metcalf to come be in conversation with Kathy Hill tonight, and that is exactly what we've done. Now, Bob was inducted as a fellow into our Hall of Fellows last October, and I know if you've been to the museum before, you've seen that wall outside that very impressive wall with, with so many important people in the computer industry, really the people who have changed the world with their innovation and their imagination. And as part of that fellow's induction effort, we take the oral histories of every fellow. We take a lot of oral histories. We have over 300 in our collection now. It's a very important part of what we do to tell the history of computing. But our chairman, Lynn Shustick, sat down with Bob in a four-hour session and got Bob's oral history. It's a tremendous and fascinating piece. And we've edited it down into about six to eight minutes. We showed it for the fellows dinner in, uh, in October. And we have it for you here tonight. And I think you're really going to enjoy it as a way of intro an introduction to tonight's panel. So let's watch that now. Take an office. Any office will do. 
no matter what its product or service, whether it be located in a business, a government agency, or in a medical or educational facility. The basic work of that office, the product of its employees' efforts, is information. Call it a paper explosion, or data overload, or asset mismanagement. The bottom line is the same. The ultimate product of the office, information, is out of control. What's needed is not a new system, but a new concept. A way to take the office as it is and make it something it has never been. An interactive network. This is the Ethernet cable. A passive carrier capable of accepting transmissions from various kinds of office machines and terminals and carrying them at millisecond speed to designated destinations. In eighth grade, I was asked to do a science project, and so I decided to build a computer. There would be a row of toggle switches labeled 1 through N, and another row of toggle switches labeled 1 through N, and then a, a row of neon lights left over from the train set. When you click the switches, you could hear the relays all settling down and displaying the results. So my science teacher uh, called it, he was the one who called it a computer instead of an adding machine. I was, going to be an, I was going to go to MIT and get a degree in electrical engineering because I owed it to my fourth grade teacher. I loved MIT from the very beginning. Pressure I loved. And there was competition and um, we worked very hard and did problem sets into the night, lots of all-nighters. My interest was in the computer side of things, operations research and modeling and uh, systems dynamics. And when I went to Harvard in applied math, it was the computer side of applied math, and then I finally got my PhD in computer science. The ARPANET, Internet 1.0, as I like to call it, was just getting started as a thing that graduate students got funded to do. So I said, hey, I just learned, I just graduated from MIT uh, learning how to um, program, uh, d digitally design things, why don't I design the interface to connect the PDP-10 to the IMP? And Harvard said, that's too important for a graduate student to do. We're going to get a company to do it. So I turned around and went down the street to um, Project Mac, uh, now known as CSAIL at MIT. There were some openings, and I said, I want to, you have an IMP, and you have a PDP-6, and then a PDP-10 later. I'd like to put those together. MIT said, okay, we'll give you a job. Your job is to connect our IMP to our PDP-6. Anyway, that got me started in the high-speed network interface business. I went to Xerox PARC because they offered me more money than anyone else. The research center was new and spiffy and full of really interesting people like Butler Lampson and Alan Kay. And I was going to be the network guy. So I s said yes. Oh, and I'd always wanted to go to California. Little did I know that Palo Alto was really far from the ocean and the beaches there, the water's really cold. In those days, Route 128 was the entrepreneurship capital of the world. This was the hot area and I was leaving it to go to the beach, basically. On May 22, 1973, I wrote a memo uh, in which Ethernet was named. And in that memo, I renamed it the Ethernet with a capital N and a space, Ether Space Net. I met a guy from Intel who was wandering around NBS looking for applications for a new PMOS process that Intel had. And I followed up with him in Santa Clara and met Andy Grove and said, gee, why don't you take your new PMOS chip and make an Ethernet chip with it? And here I've got DEC and Xerox talking. Why don't you join us and we will make this Ethernet standard, which is why I founded 3Com on June 4th, 1979, for the purpose of serving the Ethernet-compatible market that was sure to develop from the cooperation among DEC, Intel, and Xerox. So 3Com was a slightly generalized notion of the Ethernet served the Ethernet compatible market. 3Com was computer communication compatibility. In August of 81, IBM had introduced its personal computer. And it seemed, my sense of it was, that it was catching on. So what I did is I bought one. And I um, put it on a table 
right outside the engineering department's cubicles. Of course, the engineers, they all came out and started looking at this thing, this, uh, this IBM PC. And before I knew it, it was open. And, and there was a card, an option slot. It was this big. And our guys are looking at it and looking at it. You know, we could do that. So we shipped in uh, September of 1982 the first uh, Ethernet for the IBM PC called the Etherlink. It would be an understatement to say the product sold well. We lucked out. The IBM PC caught on. And, um, and the channel of distribution appropriate for us also caught on. So much to our good fortune, computer retailing started. And it was that channel of distribution combined with our product, combined with the sex, success of the IBM PC, our numbers just took off. Our products worked. But our customers said, yeah, your products work just like you said, but they're not very useful. Well, that's devastating. Why aren't they useful? So I drew a graph. And the graph had number of nodes on the network along the bottom and dollars vertical. And the cost of the network was a straight line. It went up $1,000 per node like this. But what's the value of the network? Well, the value of the network must have something to do with the number of nodes that you can connect to from your PC. N. And then each node has that value. That is, it can talk to N other no N minus one other nodes. And there's N of those. So the total value of the whole network is N times N minus one, which is approximately N squared. And that becomes a quadratic line. It goes like this. And there's this point out there where the linear and the quadratic cross. And so for small n, the value is below the cost. And then there's a critical mass point. And then above that, the value greatly exceeds the cost and gets better all the time. Network effect. So we went back to our customers. We gave them a reason why they weren't useful. You have not achieved critical mass. That reason seemed plausible. Wouldn't you know, we started selling $30,000 networks to these people. George Gilder started working on a book that ultimately was named Telecosm. It was a follow-on to his earlier book called Microcosm. Microcosm, I believe, is the book in which Moore's Law was touted. I mean, he interviewed me, and he asked me for a bunch of stuff, and I showed him my you know, artifacts. And he saw this slide showing the straight line and the quadratic with the critical mass point. And he said, that's Metcalfe's law. Technological innovation is the source of all progress. So you should be in the technological innovation business, at the core of which is science and engineering. It's the highest calling is to be in technological innovation. Democracy, freedom, prosperity, they all stem from technological innovation. And the world needs more of us. One of the big problems in the world today is energy. The world needs cheap and clean energy. Cheap and clean, not just cheap, not just clean, but cheap and clean energy. The world needs it. Too many of the people who have noticed it are Luddites and Greens and Marxists and politicians and lawyers and people who are in no position to solve the problem. However, scientists, engineers, entrepreneurs, and venture capitalists, we can solve the problem. So just like it took us 30 years to break the back of the communication monopolies and build the internet, we are going to take the next 30 years to break the back of the uh, energy monopolies and meet the world's needs for clean and cheap energy. So I have to tell you, at the end of that, <clears throat> at the fellow's dinner, someone in the corner yelled, Metcalf for president, and everybody jumped up and there was a huge ovation. It was a, a wonderful evening. This is a slightly more uh, well-behaved and sober crowd, I would say, tonight. So, uh, so I would say we have a very civil uh, and very accomplished business executive who's going to carry on the conversation with Bob that he's already begun with us tonight, and her name is Kathy Hill. Kathy Hill is the Senior Vice President for Cisco's Access Networking and Services Group. She oversees an enormous and enormously important amount of Cisco's business. Access routing, Ethernet switching, security, wireless and small business technology. And those areas are more than $10 billion in revenue per, per year for Cisco. So she has a big portfolio. She has important management responsibilities within Cisco with the Cisco Development Council, which is only nine people. 
and a uh, cross-functional team responsible for a significant part of the things that Cisco invests in and executes in the commercial segment. She led the desktop switching business unit before that and grew that to multiple billion dollars in revenue. Before that, she was with Ascend and Newbridge Networks and Hughes Network System. She's going to try to ride herd over Bob tonight, but her first job is to introduce him. And it's a pleasure to welcome Kathy. Thank you. Thank you, John. Boy, what a job I've got ahead of me, huh? Um, so the elevator pitch on Bob Metcalf, if you didn't get it, is Bob led the, the invention, the standardization, and commercialization of the Ethernet local area network system for personal computers. And with this in great uh, history, he has become known as the father of Ethernet. And you heard a lot about Bob, but I'm going to give you kind of the timeline in case you didn't get all the numbers. 1946. Bob's born Brooklyn, New York. Gets his bachelor's degree from MIT in 69, goes to Harvard, master's in applied mathematics. Gets his PhD from Harvard in 73 in computer science, I think. And his dissertation is on packet communication, so foreboding things to come. In 72, Bob went to Xerox Park, worked with some of the folks we mentioned, Jerry Eklund, Bob Taylor, Butler Lampson, and Chuck Thacker. These were all people developing the early PCs. Bob, in collaboration with Dave Boggs, invented and developed Ethernet. And then in 79, Bob left Park and started 3Com. 3Com is where uh, he worked on the standards and built PC LAN products. And 3Com went public in 84 and is a public company today. Around those times, one of the key things Bob did was become kind of the broker between DEC, Intel, and Xerox, um, and created the, helped them to uh, decide to support the standardization of Ethernet. And this led to what many of us know as the ever all important Blue Book specification of Ethernet. Um, today in Ethernet, uh, so in, we're in early 2009, in 2008, uh, the uh, people who track these things said that manufacturers shipped 312,000 ports just in 2008 of Ethernet. I'm sorry, 312 million ports. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. <laughs> well, there were some thousands there too. Okay. Um, so we're almost done with this history. And, and at this point now, um, uh, from 1990 to 2000, uh, Bob went into publishing and published a book. Uh, one book was called Internet Collapses. He published weekly internet columns for InfoWorld. And then after 10 years doing that, in 2001, Bob joined Polaris Venture Partners and became a venture capitalist. And so uh, we will hear about more of what he's been doing lately. Uh, but I also want to just recognize the many honors that Bob has received, starting with the ACM's Grace Hopper Award, the IEEE Medal of Honor, the IEEE Alexander Graham Bell Medal, National Medal of Technology, and induction into the National Inventors Hall of Fame. And last but most important to this room, in 2008 he became a Computer History Museum Fellow. So it is my great pleasure to introduce and welcome Bob Metcalf. decided we're going to talk about some things here and you've got question cards so you're going to be able to submit questions. We're going to try and keep it um, light and fun, informative. We aren't going to argue too much, right? No. Right? Okay. <laughs> well, let's, I mean, there's a couple of things we, we've said we want to talk about, right? We certainly have to go back and, and talk about Ethernet. We've got to talk about what it means to be an innovator and then what it means, kind of what, what's currently relevant. But let's start with Ethernet, because it's clearly a successful story of innovation, right? Um, we, we currently have the benefit of hindsight, and uh, I know that you've given a lot of talks and you've talked about the past a lot, so we'll try not to, to, to go too far back. But, uh, you know, I am an engineer and I'm someone whose business is based upon Ethernet and switched Ethernet. So hopefully we can share some of the right things that you did, some missed opportunities maybe. Um, we certainly have a lot of uh, how did it actually happen, 
Um, but let's start with something that I'm personally curious of it, about, which is Ethernet. Everybody, I'm trusting everyone here is an Ethernet user. Everyone knows what Ethernet is. But is it really right to call what, what generally all of us use today as Ethernet, which to our, our computer is a switch to either fast Ethernet or gigabit Ethernet? Is it really right to call that the Ethernet you invented in 73? Are they both the same Ethernet? There is no connection. None whatsoever? Between. Excellent. Those 312 million ports? <laughs> well, it's, it's million. It's, uh, <laughs> so this comes up a lot as to you know, what is Ethernet. And that was, this has been 35 years, so there's been a little evolution and proliferation. And my favorite way of expressing this is that by late 1981, there were people buying Ethernet whom I did not know personally. <laughs> And by 1985, there were people inventing Ethernet who I did not know personally. And so it's been invented by a bunch of people, many of whom show up at conferences just like this to unmask the fraud that I am. Because Don't forget, there are question <coughs> cards, question <laughs> cards, yeah. And they have a point because the, probably the best thing I ever did is on May 22nd, 1973, called it Ethernet, and that name has kind of stuck. And that that's was a good one. That's cool. Uh, but it's also true that whenever a new technology comes along to overthrow Ethernet, they end up calling it Ethernet. So it, the name is mm -hmm. going on and on. So you could argue that it's uh, Ethernet really means CSMA CD on coaxial cable. Mm -hmm. Or you could argue that uh, Ethernet is any outcome of Project 802.3. Or you could argue that it's a packet format that transcends media. But what I think it is is a business model. That is it. Hey, what are you laughing at? <laughs> a business it, model. It's a business model. And here's the features of the business model. Um, it starts with a de, fact, a de jure standard, not de facto, but de jure. It starts with a private enterprise implementing that standard in fierce competition. It involves a market, a market ethic that you can compete with Ethernet, but you have to be interoperability, uh, interoperable. You're not allowed to compete with incompatibilities. You, the standard evolves with, uh, involves with market input, but it always preserves the install base so it can leverage off Metcalfe's law. Uh, and that business model, which is different from the IBM vertically integrated business model of the past century, and it's different from the, uh, say, the open source business model, but that business model is what works. Was your uh, real, was the invention in 73, did you have all those pieces? I mean, did you, did oh. you conceive of all of that? Especially no, the openness uh, occurred in um, February of 79 in a meeting at Digital Equipment Corporation where the Vice President, Gordon Bell, who hangs around here, asked me to, he, had, he admired Ethernet, and he wanted me to do an Ethernet for DEC. I just left Xerox. I expressed discomfort with doing that. It didn't seem like the right thing to do. But we had the idea that, well, wait a minute. Why don't we just go to Xerox and cooperate um, and make a standard of it, as you heard in that video. Mm -hmm. And then, then the funny thing happened. The three companies found it difficult to meet because antitrust was very active. IBM was being sued and so on. So they were a little reluctant to conspire on this standard. So I called up my a former roommate from college, who happened to be a lawyer in antitrust, Howard Charney, perhaps you know. I know Howard, yes. And asked Howard how to avoid this antitrust problem, and he gave me five things you had to do to not run afoul of antitrust. So I called up Xerox Deck and Intel, I gave him Howard's list of five, uh, one of which was you had to be conspiring to develop an open standard. So it wasn't until then that this idea of Ethernet as an open standard popped out. And it popped out for a funny reason, which was to, to mitigate antitrust hmm. risks. So that was late. OK. So um, you know, when you talk about inventing Ethernet, you know, the CSMA CD version, so you and Dave Boggs are, I guess, on record as the inventors, the two There's of There's four of us, uh, Dave and I and uh, Butler Lamson and Chuck Thacker okay. on the patent. Okay. So uh, who did what? And what does it, I mean, what does it mean? When I think of Ethernet, I think of the Blue Book, right? <laughs> But what did you actually do? Who, I mean, did anybody you know, wire anything up? Did, it, did you just write documents? Um, oh, oh no. What did you do? 
Well, I was recruited to be the networking guy, and um, the lab decided to put a computer on every desk, which was novel. And yeah. no one had Expensive, such a thing. Probably. Now, my great fortune, my second piece of big luck, my first piece was my being born to my parents, but the second one was being given the job of networking a building full of personal computers, and that circumstance had never occurred previously, so I lucked into that job. And then had worked on the ARPANET and learned about the, the uh, Aloha Network at the University of Hawaii, and combined those two, and then with Butler and Chuck and Dave and others, we uh, decided to run coax down the middle of the corridor and connect all these machines together. And then we built little cards to plug into this PC. The NICs. We didn't call them NICs, but they became known as NICs. I think it was Ralph Ungerman called them NICs for the first time, much to my annoyment, annoyance. So we made these cards. And, and as you know, if you've ever designed stuff on a card, the card becomes a constraint, real estate. So a lot of the features of Ethernet come, come from that, the constraints of that card. For example, its speed. We didn't do market research and decide that 2.94 megabits per second was the perfect speed for the first Ethernet. We didn't have uh, room for a clock on the board. And the Alto had a clock that ticked every 340 nanoseconds. And if you do the math, that's 2.94 megabits per second. So we built this card, and then we wrote some microcode. And then we started writing protocols, what, mm -hmm. what, you know, the higher level stuff of file transfer and all that stuff on top of it. So built hardware. Oh, we needed a transceiver that is to drive the coax, and that's analog. <laughs> so uh, David, uh, David's kind of an analog guy, but this was a real specialty, so we recruited a guy named Tat Lamb, who was wandering around the building, who was an analog guy, and he designed the first, I haven't seen Tat in a very long time, but he, great guy, he designed this little transceiver that um, punctured the coax. Uh, tapped into it so the network could keep running while you were installing and uninstalling the network. So that, th that's what we did to invent it. We built all those things. And then did the actual protocol and the programming to go with it? But the actual programming. You, you, did you do the actual <laughs> programming? I'm trying to get, you know, what just, you well, know. Well, we wrote a file transfer stuff? protocol. We wrote a printing protocol. We built the, uh, the group built the first laser printer. and. Mm -hmm. And we wrote a protocol for printing on it. And um, so you basically, uh, we did a telnet protocol for, so we could log into our mini computer and we got that to run. And, but you, you know, all the stuff that you sell, we did. Yeah, great, thank you, thanks. You made it all easy, you made it all easy. So, so when did you realize it was gonna be transformational? I mean, it sounds like a tremendous amount of fun. Um, but sometimes when you're having fun, you might not realize this is going to really change the world. Well, the first aha was there was a t in the early time, the very early time when David and I were first getting it working, it was the uh, Ethernet was going to be an optional part of the Alto. You know, the Alto that's downstairs here. Each scientist would get to buy an Alto, and then he would check the box if he wanted an Ethernet card for the Alto. It was optional. And then one day we had 10 of these machines and somebody disconnected the cable accidentally, took the terminator off the end. And 10 people <laughs> stood up like this to see what the hell was going on. And that wasn't the first time that that experience occurred. <laughs> <laughs> and in that moment, Ethernet stopped being an option. Uh -huh. It became what you get with your Alto. So that was a big aha. Mm -hmm. ah, something's going on here. No longer optional. Ethernet is not an option, Dave Boggs used to say. It's not an option. So that was a big one. Then the, um, hmm. Hmm. There's sort of so many little steps. There wasn't a big moment. I guess when Deck Intel and Xerox announced their collaboration, that's what triggered the business planning for 3Com was, wow, Deck Intel and Xerox have adopted this. There's going to be an opportunity here to service a standard market. So I guess that was a big breakthrough. And then there was when the first um, Ethernet chip worked. That made it possible to put Ethernet on the Etherlink, on the, on the um, 
IBM PC, and Ron Crane, who's sitting right over there, built that. He built the card, but that chip, which we got from a company called Seek, not from Intel, because Intel was too slow. That's, that's, well, unusual for Intel, but that time, they were slow. And then Seek, a company called Seek Technology developed an Ethernet chip and plugged it into Ron's card, Ron and others. Um, it worked, so that was a big moment. Well, Ethernet, or sorry, Intel did get into that business, you know, of building Ethernet chips. We, we've used them on and off for the years. They go well, in this is out. a long time ago. Things happen over the years. So we're, <laughs> that was 1982. So we shipped the first Etherlink in the September through computer land, or business land, maybe, in September of 1982. It was business land. It was Enzo Teresi uh, bought it for business land in September of 82, as I recall. So that's before. Before we'll Cisco? Before Cisco, a little bit, for a little bit before we did that. Yeah, a little yeah. bit, a little bit. Well, speaking of those companies, it's just, do you ever go into Best Buy and you're walking around Best Buy and you hear people talk about Ethernet? Do you, do you just want to tell them so I walked, what your role is? I'm glad you brought that up. I, brought, I, I went into, um, uh, what is it called? Not Best Buy, I think it may have been Staples, one of those. And I needed an Ethernet cable for my daughter. <laughs> And there was a woman standing at the cash register who had, you know how they have different colors of hair and then all those little things in their ears like this? <laughs> jewelry. Jewelry and, and tattoos and stuff. And I approached her apprehensively and said, do you have, uh, can you show me where the ethernet cables are? And she said, oh yeah, <laughs> come with me. And she took me to the back and there was like a 20 foot wall of Ethernet cables, and she says, what color would you like? <laughs> but it, it got better. So we established the color and the length, and then she says, do you want one of the cables that has the little reversal <laughs> in it so that you can plug direct to rect, or do you want the regular kind? And I, it was in that moment, speaking of a uh, high, I realized <laughs> Ethernet had made it. <laughs> And you didn't feel you had to tell her that, I mean. No, I've tried that. Have, yeah. I have tried that. It didn't, it, What it I often do is I'll, you know, I'll check into a hotel and I'll forget. And then I'll say to the, I'll see a little ethernet jack and I'll say, I invented that. And then <laughs> they're tempted to call the police at that point. <laughs> yeah. So I don't do yeah, that Yeah, probably best. I don't. Um, so, you know, Ethernet was one of the great inventions. What else really impressed you? I mean, it's in 30 years. I mean, there have, as you say, there have been so many little ways that Ethernet went, but what, what else do you think, gosh, wish he'd really, if you didn't do Ethernet, what would you have wanted to have done when you look back? Oh, you didn't tell me you were going to ask that question. Well, you know, I said, you know, I had to keep some of these alive. What is it I wish I had done? Yeah, what, if you hadn't done Ethernet, what would you have invented? What do you wish you'd invented? I wish I had invented GPS. GPS? GPS. I wish I'd invented GPS. Because GPS makes a big difference. It's in universally my life. helpful. <laughs> <laughs> I'd never, I wouldn't have gotten here today yes. without GPS. You know? <laughs> right? So GPS is cool. I've always admired all of uh, Steve Jobs' products. I'd love to have worked on those. Never exactly did. Although he did uh, put Ethernet in his products eventually. Eventually. Well, he, he did the cheapy version first called Apple Talk, where he took the idea and made it cheap. He did a really cool mm -hmm. thing with it. Mm -hmm. That eventually upgraded to the real thing. <laughs> so, you know, it's a common path in Silicon Valley to go for, to start your own company. And, and obviously you took that path. Um, but, but you left there, kind of, I mean, how many years were you at Precom? Uh, all told, 13 if you count the year of formation and the year of consulting afterwards. So, and, you know, the starting the company in Silicon Valley is a key part of innovation. Um, do you think that remains true today? The kind of the way the venture capitalists, the starting the company is, certainly we see a lot fewer companies get started today. Was that, was that an essential part? Could you have done what you did without starting your own company? There wasn't a thought process there. It was once having come to Silicon Valley, it was wired that we would 
start a company. It's just what you did. We, we saw Steve Jobs did it, and Bob Noyce did it, and Bill and Dave did it, and so that's how what you did. You did it. You, um, so I left Xerox in 79 to pursue entrepreneurial ambitions. I had no idea what they would be, but that seemed to be the next step. It was the normal thing. And my mother, of course, was concerned that I was leaving a perfectly good job. <laughs> And I said, well, you know, if I fail, I can go back, probably. <laughs> <laughs> she hadn't thought of that. So the risks are exaggerated. Uh -huh. you, in the Valley, one of the nice things about the, as I remember, now I haven't lived here for a while. I moved out. And what I like telling the story is that 128 was big, and then I moved to Silicon Valley, and then Silicon Valley became big. And now I've moved back to Boston, and, and um, Boston has an inferiority complex with respect to Silicon Valley. We always meet to discuss what are we doing wrong in Boston and, <laughs> and how great is it in the Valley. And I keep telling them, well, I'm back now. So yeah, everything's going to okay be now. fine. It's okay now. It's okay now. Good, good. So what was actually more fun? I mean, was it, was it more fun to create the standard, to start the company, or to spend all the money that you made? You know? Oh, that's a tough question. They were all fun. But to, to those entrepreneurs out there thinking, what, where, would you, where, where are they going to have the most fun? A lot of answers to that. Uh, one of my favorite ones was I went to the first really big company picnic we had. It was at a local park. I forget which one, but there were 2,000 people there. And there were little kids about this big and this big, and I realized it's worried me actually. We were, I was responsible, we, I was responsible for making decisions related to all those little kids and their college educations. So that was fun and also a burden. So when I went back to the executive committee meeting the next Monday, it was much more serious because we, there, I couldn't be flippant as I usually am. I had to, oh my God, I have all these people to take care of. So that was kind of a big fun thing was to realize um, the impact on that you were having on people's lives, the people mm -hmm. who worked in the company. Um, it's fun for me to walk around and stay at hotels, and it says Ethernet on the little, <laughs> the, you know, on I that desk in the them. hotel room. It's often it'll say Ethernet right there, and sometimes it says LAN, but that's not half as much fun as seeing Ethernet there. <laughs> um, another fun part was the the uh, camaraderie at the team. It's one of the things I miss as a venture capitalist. I don't get to be in any of the, I'm in, on the board of eight companies, but I'm not in the team of any of the eight companies. And I miss, that was a really great part of um, being in that phase of innovation was the team we had and succeeding and failing and changing and being together. And a lot of the team is here tonight. I haven't seen Larry Birnbaum yet, but I hear he's here. There he is over there. But he was on the team. He and I played squash together at MIT. He was a younger man, class of 69. <laughs> and, uh, and then he, he showed up at 3Com one day. And, and uh, so he was part of it. And then Ron Crane's right over there. And Bill Krauss was here a moment ago. And these are all people that were that there through the 80s. And Sounds like fun, yeah. So that's a fun part, too. But it's fun being a VC. Tell me a little bit more about that, because that's not everybody takes that path off of a lot of people take, too many people take that path. There's, a, there's 700 venture capital firms in the United States, and there only should be 200. There might, there might be more like 200 pretty soon. Pretty soon, that's where it's going. It's not pleasant being a venture capitalist right about now. It's not pleasant being anybody. It's pretty right hard about being now. everywhere now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But this too shall pass. So it's fun being, a, it, there's a, it's a different kind of fun being a venture capitalist. And you're not allowed to futz around as much as when you're in the company. And that's frustrating. But often you want to just do it yourself and you're not allowed to. There's rules against that. So my, but my perception, uh, having been at a startup company once, was that kind of I, I actually viewed the VCs as, I wasn't, the, I wasn't a founder, but I kind of viewed the VCs as the enemy because they really, all they cared about was, you know, was getting their return. And we cared about kind of invention creation you don't, I mean, and then I thought being a VC, you'd be the person who just cared about money and not about the invention. But you don't see that? That's... I care about the money a lot. 
that's my job. I mean, I have customers who are called limited partners. Many of them are pension funds with widows and orphans so this depending is on taking, the outcome. Taking those kids and their college education a and little so further. So my job is to get the IRR uh -huh. to be higher, and I'm not embarrassed about that. Uh, frankly, the people in the company are, have a certain interest in making money. I don't think money is evil. I'm sorry. I'm not going to apologize for that. On the other hand, uh, the most successful people don't put money first. It's on the list. But they put, as Steve Jobs is my favorite example of this, doing insanely great products. And, uh, that's the real model. Having a superordinate goal uh, in connection with your focus on money is always a healthy thing. Okay. Um, so on innovation, you know, there's been a lot of books written. I don't think it's one of the ones you wrote, but there's been books written lately about how we're in a crisis of innovation, that we don't innovate anymore, and especially in the U.S. This is really, on the, certainly on the top of my mind, the, you know, the folks I work with, we, we don't like to read these so much, don't feel that's true, but you, know, you see a different part of, of the world than I do. What do you think? Is, that, is there reality in that? Well, I've written books. Uh, I can tell you that you should not believe everything you read. <laughs> <laughs> and in particular, you shouldn't believe what you read in newspapers and you just get you all depressed and everything. So no, I don't, I don't detect a really substantial difference. I mean, there was a time when, there was a time when everything had been invented, that recurred, that recurred every few years. Everything's been done now and we're just gonna go 11 bits per second instead of 10. And like the storage, I remember when disks were invented, suddenly all the disks were done now. We have enough disk companies and then a new company came. So I don't, in my own experience, do not see this gloom and doom about innovation thing. I don't feel it. I mean, I know about the books you're talking about. Mm -hmm. We'll just write different books about how it's, how it's going so well. And, and this is a bad time to read books, because there's already enough depressing stuff going on. Don't read those so books. Are you, so does this mean your book writing time is over? Are you back, are you writing any books now? Well, I, pl I have plans for three or four books. Someday. And should we read them, or? <laughs> it's just being logical here, you know. No, 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 you don't read the books that will get you down. <laughs> and I won't ever write a book that will get All right. you down. Okay. So it's oh, okay. I'm going to write a book about Metcalf's Law someday, I think. I think okay. it's a great title. Metcalf's Law? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds a bit like a TV series. I don't know, you know, with a detective and anyway. Um, so, so if you're a writer, and, and I'm, I'm pretty impressed that you did 10 years writing that. I think that's, that's pretty impressive. But does it, do you blog? I mean, do you Twitter? Oh, I have uh, to ask that because, you know. Uh, you know. No. No? Neither but, one? Neither one, but we have plans. <laughs> and so my son uh, Twitters. He is pushing me, so I'm going to be tweeting. So I understand that's the verb. Oh, you, tweeting? You tweet. You tweet? Is that right? Yeah. yeah. So I plan to tweet soon. Okay. So that I'm sure that I'll have how lots of... How many of you folks are, is, can, we, can we tweet with? So my wow. son subscribes to Lance Armstrong's Twitter account. Is that the right terminology? So my son constantly knows where Lance Armstrong is and what he's doing in excruciating detail. Why would anyone want to know what I'm doing? <laughs> I don't quite get this. I think we'll be finding out soon. So. What do you think about blogs? I mean, where do you put, do you think that, you know, the, certainly the magazines you wrote for, there's not as many magazines around. Do you think that's the right medium? Is it a valuable medium? The, uh, the newspapers you may have noticed are in decline. And I couldn't be happier about that. They started declining in 84. Okay. That is a newspaper circulate, daily newspaper circulations headed south in 1984, which happens to be the same year that TCPIP was installed on the internet. I don't know. Pure Causality, I don't know. And the uh, so-called blogs are the new media, and they will replace newspapers, but not blogs as we know them today, but as they play out over time. And I'm looking forward to this, because I view the newspapers as they currently exist as uh, old-fashioned, corrupt, clunky <laughs> things, and the blogs are too new to 
quite replace them, but they're going to replace them. Uh -huh. They're going to get bureaus. They're going to get editors. They're going to get investigative journalists. They're going to get all that. Not exactly the blogs we have today, but something close to it. And then, and then we can stop with this newspaper stuff. So Except the crossword puzzle is very valuable to yeah. me. <laughs> well, you can do that on computers now. It's true. It's true. It's true. It's true. It's true. <coughs> Every morning I get the New York Times, which I can't convince you get my it on pa and in paper. Home I can't convince my wife to cancel my subscription. So I get it and I go to the art section. I search through it to find the crossword uh -huh. puzzle and I carefully cut it out with a pair of scissors. And then I take the rest of the newspaper and I pile it over there for my wife to read. And then I do the crossword puzzle. And that's about the only thing that they're that good the for. The newspaper is good for? Yes. Good. Is anyone from the newspaper here? <laughs> <laughs> not any longer, not any longer. So, um, so you're creative. What other, what other visions do you have you know, for, the, for the grade schoolers? What's their life going to be like? Um, that we can, that what's going to be different for them? due to technology? Hmm. Twitter is not enough. No. Not without so, you on it. No. The answer that I've been working on to that question, in all seriousness, has to do with energy. So I've, it feels in energy like the computer business and the internet business felt in the 70s and 80s. It feels like it's ready to get fixed. And I'm not the only person who thinks that. So that the, uh, the next big thing is energy. That's, so my theory is that now our children and we enjoy squ a squanderable abundance of bandwidth and computing capability thanks to what's happened since you know, the transistor and the birth of the internet and so on. So I think in my lifetime and these kids you were just talking about, they will experience a squanderable abundance of energy. We just have to figure out how to do it, how to deliver, as you heard, cheap and clean energy. So a bunch of us are working on that. A bunch of former internet tycoons have turned their attention to solving energy. It's a, a good and great goal. Now we just have to do it, and it'll take a long time. That's so, why I'm planning to live to be 124 years old. <laughs> Excellent. So you can do two eras? Is this the internet era and the energy era? Yeah. And the reason I chose that number, because that means I'm in the middle of my midlife crisis right now. <laughs> and I have a red convertible. <laughs> it's a smart car. Really? A, a red convertible smart car? Yes. Excellent. I traded in my 12-cylinder Mercedes for a three-cylinder Mercedes. <laughs> and it's kind of a pig. It only gets 38 miles per gallon, and that's not nearly enough. To break, a, I'm shopping for a car where I can get a hundred. Good, good. Lots of ideas. Lots I'm of ideas here. Searching for a car I can afford. <laughs> so let, let's 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 talk more about energy because uh, you know that's the that's the future looking forward. And as you say, it's a serious topic because there are a lot of challenges there. Um, but one of the things is you mentioned a lot of internet folks are working on this, and certainly here in Silicon Valley. Um, I have to tell you, probably 90% of the people that, that were my coworkers that had been at Cisco a long time, whatever, they've all gone into energy. So, but it's not, it, it's not intuitively obvious in a way that created, you know, inventing e Ethernet or the internet. Why do we have you know, the, the right to believe or the, you know, what gives us the, the leg up on going after energy versus everybody else in the world? First, I have to make the point that the, we're not done with the internet yet, so it's not as if we're going to stop working on the internet and start working on energy. There's a lot of headroom for the internet, but the uh, but Ethernet, uh, sorry, energy, has opened up as an opportunity. I guess it begins with E, just like Ethernet. That's why it's attractive. energy. Yeah, energy, yeah. So the uh, the internet tycoons, you know, Vinod and John. Long line of them have entered energy, and they're not welcome there. The, the energy we are not welcome there. The energy people who've been working on energy for all these years resent the arrival, and they ask that question, the one you asked. They say, "Well, what right have you to mm -hmm. to be here?" To which I respond, "Listen, 
You've had the energy problem for 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 years, and you haven't solved it, so get out of the way. Here we come. <laughs> Understandably, they do not like this answer, <laughs> which is fine. Mm -hmm. you know, it's an argument. So the, so the, um, I think the internet offers a lot of guidance for how we're gonna solve energy. And so that's sort of how I weasel, or we weasel into this space. We say, look, we just finished approximately delivering cheap and clean bandwidth to the world in squanderable abundance. So now that innovation infrastructure, we're now gonna shift and try to do it for energy. I think that's a respectable point of view. Now we just have to you know, make it happen. So do they have, I mean, there mu do you get the, the uh, objection to the, even the concept of squanderable abundance of energy? Oh, do, they, yeah. do the green, clean folks say that's the wrong direction? The Greens, so-called, uh, with whom I am hostile, well, they started it. <laughs> I mean, they come in under this environmental thing, but then they stack in there, you know, at the protests, the violent protests, they, you know, stack in there. Pro-environment, anti-capitalism, anti-technology, <laughs> anti-American, anti just about every good idea that I've ever had. So I'm trying to convince the energy field to switch colors, to go from green to blue. The sky is blue. Oceans are blue. Even the occasional nuclear reactor glows blue. <laughs> And I've checked the absorption spectrum of photosynthesis, and it's bimodal. Even plants don't like green. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so tell us more. So how, I mean, what, first of all, what does it mean for you to talk? I mean, what, what's the vision? You mentioned the squanderable abundance, but what, what's the vision for your interest? In Energy is uh, an important component in prosperity, just like bandwidth is. So if we're gonna be free and prosperous, we better, for those three traditional reasons, we're running out of oil, coal, and gas, and it's getting expensive, and it's in the wrong hands, national security, and then there's that climate thing. So those are three awfully good reasons to, to, to work urgently on it. Is that what you mean? Right. Well, so in what, do, I mean, how are you going to get involved personally? How do you involve, in, in what areas, in what direction? Well, my job is to be a venture capitalist and to focus on the money, I think you, I think. <laughs> so I I'm now investing in what I call Enertech energy. I avoid green tech, for the obvious reason. And uh, they call it Enertech, energy tech, you know, biotech, mm -hmm. nanotech, infotech, Enertech. And inventing, in, investing in it in the same way that we invested in Infotech, in, in that Silicon Valley model of how you, or how you get research professors and you get graduating students and you get scaling entrepreneurial teams and you get venture capitalists and you then start fighting with each other competitively. You know, like Three Common Cisco used to fight before you won. <laughs> that kind of fierce competition. Fierce, That's the model. Right, so. Right, right. That would be the innovation style that I, I recommend. So who's, the, who's gonna be the Xerox part of the energy? I mean, so research, I think, you know, research is fundamental here, right? Is there, I mean, do we have to start with putting the money there? Well, not with Xerox Park, actually. Or, um, in studying the history of the internet, I concluded that companies are probably not where the research should be done. Because only monopolies can afford research. And mm -hmm. Xerox Park was supported by the copier monopoly, and Bell Labs by the telephone monopoly, and Watson by the mainframe monopoly, and I'll stop there. It wasn't a sustainable model. Well, monopolies are bad, A, B, because they charge their customers too much, and B, because when they have the ideas, they're really bad at bringing them to market because they're not really motivated to, because they own the market, so why should they? So, 
And then there's government labs as another alternative. That's clearly a loser. Right? The government labs, there are probably some government lab people here, and I apologize, and I don't really mean it, and I'm probably wrong, but they strike me as an unproductive use of research dollars. And one of the problems is you put money into energy, and the Department of Energy sucks it all up and doesn't send it where it can do the most good, which is at research universities. And in Boston, we have 10 major research universities. I think there's some here, too. A few. A few. A few. They might let you visit someday, you know. There's a few. I've lost track of what well, question so, I Well, so how do, we get, how do we get the progress that's really needed, right? So you, you described the kind of the ecosystem that the internet was based on. Where would you, you've got a lot of people here, where would you like to see people focus? Where do we need well, the attention, both of your money, the venture capitalists, but also of, of the, the brains here? It's gonna, this energy problem is not gonna be solved in a short period of time. If the inter internet is any guide, it'll take us 62 years to do energy. That means there's time for science, and that means this big stimulus package ugh, should direct some money into research so we can do some science at the research universities on energy and, and climate. Uh, so that would be a very good first step. The venture capitalists are now, like me, are pursuing the science that exists, mm -hmm. but we're gonna need much more of it, so I'd recommend that. So starting with research, generating more of the people that are gonna? Knowledge and people uh, to spin out and start new companies to start the next, the energy Cisco. You really think it's going to take us 62 years? Uh, roughly. It, but no, the key point about saying that, aside from the fact that I'm 62 years old, so I like that number, uh, is there are people who believe that what we're going to do is take the stimulus package, go to Washington, have a Manhattan project, and solve energy. It's going to be, if the internet is any guide, it's going to be nothing like that at all. Mm -hmm. the, the Manhattan project was a short term engineering project, it wasn't a long term science project. So that's a completely broken model, so we shouldn't do that. Plus, there's a general problem that when you go to Washington to get stuff, you often get the wrong stuff. How many of you are in favor of corn ethanol? <laughs> Anyone from Iowa here? <laughs> I ask that question frequently. I don't know who voted for corn ethanol, because there's no one raises their hand when I ask that question. But that's a really good example. Have you been to Iowa and asked it? I have not asked it in Iowa. I should You're do on that. the coast probably asking it, right? When you go to Washington, sometimes you get the wrong stuff. My favorite example of that, just to annoy more of you, Jimmy Carter created the Department of Energy in the late 70s after the OPEC oil crisis. The purpose of the Department of Energy thereby formed was to reduce our dependence on foreign oil. <laughs> DOE has existed for 30 years, its current budget is approaching $25 billion a year, and I'm asking how we doing on our dependence on foreign oil. Not really well. So when we go to Washington this time, why don't we start by fixing the Department of Energy? Which, by the way, is largely focused on nuclear, and there hasn't been a new nuclear reactor in the United States in 30 years. <laughs> What's that about? So let's fix that too. So be careful. So part of my answer to your question is rushing off to Washington mm -hmm. willy-nilly is probably not a great idea. Okay. Well, I think I've noticed that we've got, it seems like a ton of questions on these cards. So I think we should, why don't we just get started with a few? I think we're ready for the, uh, you ready to, to uh, jump, jump? Oh, before, we, while they're bringing them up, let me ask you one more question while they're bringing up. So um, when's retirement? What does retirement look like? I, I have uh, attempted retirement three times, so I'm an expert on this question. Uh -huh. And uh, I have failed three times. It's, um, I think retirement is an outmoded concept. Um, my father's, uh, may he rest in peace, his whole life was about retiring, sending me to college and retiring, with both of which he accomplished. He retired at the age of 50 on a union pension. And he, um, that model doesn't fit anybody I know. He was happy in retirement, but I, I wasn't. And it, plus, there's this age thing. You know, 60 is the new 30. <laughs> so 
So I've been lucky enough to have a series, as you heard, a series of careers, you know, science, entrepreneurship, journalism, venture capital. I think that's more and more going to be the norm because we're all going to have time to do five things in our lives instead of just one like my dad did. So that's what I think of so retirement. So plenty of things, yeah. Okay, all right. Okay, so here's, the, here's a few of the questions and keep them coming here. So what do you think of the, the new startups, the Web 2.0 startups, Silicon Valley? So there was a question, but I think Web 2.0. Does that work for you? Does that... Well, we are investors in several of those companies, so we have a Web 2.0 activity. It smacks of the, you know, the dot-com um, <laughs> bubble. It smacks of it. There's a lot of fury about it and a lot of overwrought um, investing going on there. But it's at, the, at its core, it's clearly a, a next generation for I'm in favor of Web 2.0, although you could easily get burned. I wouldn't do pets.com if I were you. The, the Web 2.0 Even the Web 2.0 version of it, I wouldn't do, no. So um, here's a question related to kind of our, our national interests. And what, techno what new technology and or paradigm shift do you envision in the near future which would pro propel our nation forward as the leading, cutting-edge innovator? presume we aren't, I guess. Wow. What new technology? Wow. The visionary skills are being tested here. What new technology would propel us to the as forefront? The, as a what was the last one? Was that Web 2.0 or was that the internet? Or yeah, it's distributed nuclear. Is that like network nuclear? F fission reactors the size of that table. Fusion ones would have to be a little bigger. So there's five fission startups out there that I've seen so far. They make reactors. They're planning to make reactors this big. That could be revolutionary. How much of Polaris would be invested in energy versus high tech? A three. Uh, Polaris is a diversified venture capital firm, so we don't have an energy fund. It's just part of our diversification. So it's probably around 10% now, and unlikely to get much bigger than that. So uh, this one is, would we have Ethernet or the Apple computer without Xerox Park? Xerox Park was heaven on earth, had a tremendous impact, I'm so lucky to have been smart enough to go there when I was invited. Um, maybe something else would have, that's an experiment we can't run, um, so maybe something else, maybe maybe we would have, a, uh, let's see, what would we have? We would have, uh, what's that? We would have token rings connecting, uh, what, what was that mini computer that IBM was so famous for, the 400? <laughs> The AS400. So we would have a world full of AS400s connecting by token rings with 3271 terminals. Have you been out here? You can, you can go visit, you can visit a lot of that, a lot of that. Um, do you think, I mean, if, if Ethernet, if you hadn't succeeded with Ethernet, would token ring have evolved to an open standard, or do you think another open standard would have come? Another open standard. There the were two problems space. with Token Ring. One is that it, it did not, it was not comfortable in the seven layer model. It tried to do too much and as a result was pretty slow and expensive comparatively. But the real problem was that IBM's heart was, not, this is a long time ago, this is not today's IBM. IBM's heart was not in an open standard. Now they saw Ethernet catching on as an open standard so they said, oh, oh we're dot five, we're a standard two. But in their dark little hearts, they didn't. <laughs> they didn't see it as a standard. So to, IBM always had 90% token uh, market share in token ring. Mm -hmm. that, that would be an indicator. <laughs> and they kind of always screwed with the compatibility. So 3Com sold token ring cards probably before IBM had them. I mean, we, we mm -hmm. my board of directors, adult supervision. 
said, you can't put all your egg, all our eggs in the Ethernet basket. IBM's coming out with token ring, so you need to have token ring products. <laughs> so we did that. And we beat IBM to market with token <laughs> rings. But we had a hard time selling them because there was always some little SMA thing uh -huh. that interfered with our, you know, into enterprises. They want to be sure these cards worked, and cards might not work depending on something really screwy IBM was doing with SMA. So that's how they kept their 90% share that's why they lost. So, so, so another open standard. Right. So you must see analogies. I mean, you mentioned going to see the energy companies. There must be analogies about openness and kind of the incumbency. Can, I mean, do you think there's a, in even a, in a part of the energy industry to make that argument too? Do they see that perhaps they're, you know, they're, they should welcome you know, venture capitalists in uh, because of that example of the so, so we're early in the in the I think we're early in the energy game, and the, and the incumbents haven't learned to play with venture capitalists. So as a consequence, we are told that energy is capital intensive, which means inappropriate for venture capital. But I think that's just because the incumbents haven't learned how to play, and that like in the drug drug industry is capital intensive, costs eight hundred million dollars to make a drug, but there's a lot of VCs, including us, active in drug discovery. And that's because the drug companies know how to play with small companies. But energy is just beginning to learn that. So we have to teach them how to play in this uh, innovation ecology we'd like to develop, I think. So what is more important for energy, conservation or generation efficiency? Well, efficiency is, is much better than conservation. Because in conservation, you have to stop doing the fun stuff. But with efficiency, you can keep doing the fun stuff, just use less energy. So conservation is really a non-starter. But efficiency isn't, it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. and, but it's not enough. We've got to learn how to generate squanderable abundance of energy, because that's what will be required to make the world prosperous for everybody. China and India are not going to put up with using less energy plus, you know, of CO2 or anything like that. They, they want to be prosperous, too, and that's going to take energy. So it's our job, it's your job, to make energy cheap and clean. Let's get on with that. Great. Um, here's one back to the Internet, though. Um, this is written out fairly precisely. So what do you think is the amount of Internet bandwidth where additional bandwidth would not provide additional value to customers? We've been searching for that limit for a long time. It's called uh, elasticity. That is, as you increase the bandwidth, does the revenues keep going up? As you lower the cost of bandwidth and increase its quantity, does the revenue keep going up? Is it price elastic? Price elastic is that the word? And elasticity comes yeah. in there somewhere. I don't think we, I think we've worried about hitting that, but so far it, I don't think we have hit it. Well, even now, now I have it's this the device consumption, right? How much you have to consume on devices? At some point, right? It's a it's a consumption. Well, the more intelligent we make our devices, yeah. the more bandwidth they require. And I have, you know, I have what you all have. I have a cable modem or something. I don't even know what it is, but it's it's fast. It's. I remember uh, this came up earlier today, declaring the definition of broadband was one megabit per second. Half the people in the room thought that was overkill and that we had passed the point of diminishing returns. This system that I now have for 50 bucks a month, it's got this 27 megabits per second download, and still it's not fast enough. Because you go to YouTube and the damn thing stalls right in the middle of the best part. And I think, I think, all right, that's a fair question and someone should think about it, but I'm not. You're not. I'm going to assume that there is that build it and they will come, make it cheap and there'll be uses for it. And this is what happened with Ethernet. It, you know, the, the speed of Ethernet was determined by the space on the, the card and the available clock. And then five years later, this happened. Five years later, someone measured the traffic on all the Ethernets in Xerox Park, and it was about 62%, some reasonable number. And 
people said, wow, you and Boggs were really clever to have figured out how much bandwidth you would need five years in advance. <laughs> and I pointed out to them that there was a bit of natural selection going on here. Any application that required more than 2.94 megabits per second didn't get off the ground. So it was, a, it was a, the bandwidth determined what applications would arrive. And I still think that's true. So well, it did for a long time. I'm not sure it does today. But I have heard you speak about terabit infringement. You heard that talk? I've heard, I've heard this, yes. Yeah, I was invited to the um, Optical Society conference, which I'd never attended. But I wanted to go to thank them because they had developed one of the internet's silver bullets, dense wave division multiplexing, which sort of made, I mean, when we started this, my mom used to say, when you get to Boston, call and let the phone ring three times and then hang up to let me know <laughs> that you're safe. But I don't want to talk to you because that would be too expensive. Well, we don't do that anymore, do we? And this is because of dense wave division multiplexing. So I went to San Diego to thank those people for their silver bullet. And they said, while you're here, give a talk. And since Ethernet is hot stuff now, <laughs> it reached San Diego last year. <laughs> talk about Ethernet. So Ethernet, you, you may know, the current frontier is 40 gigabits per second and 100 gigabits per second. So I decided I couldn't talk you about couldn't that. Stop there, right. So oh, I decided to try to analyze what the path would be from where we are now at 10 to 40 to 100, all the way out to terabit. Ethernet, and it was it was hilarious what happened because there were a bunch of people who said, "Well, hell, we've been doing terabit Ethernet for years." Really, uh, <laughs> pray tell. What have you been doing? <laughs> so what they were counting was all the tens added up on the backplane. The total bandwidth of the switch was a terabit. By I said, "No, no, no, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a terabit per second on a single lambda of a dense wave division system." I said, ah, well, that's never going to happen. <laughs> and uh, we'll see. Opportunity for innovation. So what inspired you to choose the name Ethernet? And did you consider other names? I've been answering that question for 35 years. I'm really good at it. <laughs> I'll let you, you can even keep that. The original, the original name was the Alto Aloha Network named for the Aloha Network, the University of Hi uh, Hawaii, a, a, a wireless packet, wireless network, much admired. And Alto was the name of the PC that we were going to connect. And it came time to write the memo. There were lots of memos, but this particular memo. And we noticed, the group of us, that we had chosen coax for our medium, but it was kind of an arbitrary choice. We could have chosen twisted pair optical fibers or like the Aloha Network wireless. So we didn't want to call it the coax network. So, you know, what, what's a word for an omnipresent, completely passive medium for the uh, propagation of electromagnetic waves? Ether, luminiferous ether. And we couldn't call it the Alto network because we had Novas and we had PDP-10s and we had, and we wanted them to be on the network. So we had to, we had to drop that. So. Ethernet, duh. Well, <laughs> that easy, huh? <laughs> that duh. easy. It caught on. And then there was a time when Xerox decided to uh, commercialize. And that, you saw it in that, um, in that video. It was going to be called the Xerox Wire because Ethernet was a little nerdy. <laughs> and um, so it was going to be called the Xerox Wire, and we were engineering it for announcement. But then Deccan Intel and others got involved in the standard effort, and they said, well, we'll go along with this standard thing. But we'll be damned if we're going to call it the Xerox wire. <laughs> so that says, so what are we going to call it? Bam, Ethernet came back. So that was pleasant. Here's a, another question that you probably get asked a lot. Why is the book blue? The Ethernet blue book? Why is it blue? I don't know. I wasn't in charge of that. I don't know. Okay. You have to ask Yogan Dalal why it's blue. I'm okay. sure he had a lot to do with it. What's that? Certainly a better choice than green. 
You know, that's there interesting. Was a red. The was TCP IP standards from the Department of Defense that came out in the winter of 79 was a green, there were four green books. And I hadn't noticed that until now. And I will start analyzing <laughs> at this point. Okay, well, back to energy. So here's your multiple choice question. What makes energy the next big thing instead of biotech, healthcare technologies, or better video game systems? There is this uh, idea afoot that you need to stick to your knitting and focus on the really important stuff and do it right. And that's basically a recipe for disaster. You have to do everything right. You can't just do one thing right. Like in a company, if you only did engineering, you'd fail. If you only did sales, you'd fail. You have to do everything, including manufacturing, finance. So that list of problems, you, we're not gonna just do energy. We have to do all those things too. But you'll notice that energy's involved in all those in things. In all those. All of them. So let's, by the way, we did need to work on health. And Polaris invests in drug discovery, medical devices, biotech. all the biotech, all those things. So let's keep doing that too. It's not an either or situation. So you mentioned lawyers and Marxists as impediments to developing cheap and abundant energy. Why didn't you mention oil company management and their political allies and the roles they played in restricting energy policy and technological innovation? Because we only had eight minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if you look at um, the internet, we had the telecom monopolies, the telopolies, which includes the carriers and their uh, equipment suppliers, which are originally was just AT&T and Western Electric, principally. And we had to break those monopolies, and the government was useful in that regard. So the government isn't completely useless, but that was helpful. But now in energy, we have a similar array of incumbents who are naturally motivated to have things stay just the way they are. That would include oil company executives. And the incumbents always have, um, they own Washington, which is why it's dangerous to go to Washington, because they own it. You know, they have their lobbyists and litigators all hanging out there. And that includes the questioner's list of bad guys. <laughs> But they're only bad because they're part of the, you know, they're part of the status quo. They're invested in the status quo and they want things to stay the same. It's our job to force them. When I say force them, I, I mean through fierce competition mm -hmm. that there's a better way. Okay. There are a lot of questions about how energy breakthroughs are going to occur. So, so one is, do you anticipate an energy solution to be incremental or a sudden breakthrough? Well, the internet teaches us that you get both. There are, a, what's that called in evolution theory? Punctuated equilibrium, where there's sort of steady progress and then suddenly something pops. Like in the mid 90s, dense wave division multiplexing <laughs> popped and it just went boom and everything took off. Now there was a lot of optics before and after, mm -hmm. but in, I think it was in around 95, it really started taking off. Switched ethernet point. Switched Big ethernet? Pop. That's where the knee of the curve in terms of the number of ports sold kind of hit. Fast switch, fast ethernet. So here's another one. Is there a Metcalf's law for energy? Uh, not yet. And by the way, you're not allowed to name your own laws after yourself. So I'm busily trying to name other people's laws. <laughs> because I think energy needs laws. The Moore's law and the other laws, um, Grosch's law. Do you all remember Grosch's law? Bigger computers are better. And then, then starting in, and Moore's Law sort of turned that over. And these laws are very useful. Uh, Moore's Law, just so stellar an example of an agenda setter for the Silicon Valley. You know? we, we had to work hard to make Gordon right again this year. <laughs> so we need similar laws, uh, agenda setters uh, for energy. And I, I don't have any yet, but I'm looking for them. There's, there's a candidate, there's sort of, the, there's a graph of the progress in solar energy. As it, so here's coal, cost of coal, going, and it's going up. Here's solar for 30 years, but going down, and you can use your semi-log paper and you get some straight lines. So, so 
So I'm looking for somebody to name that law after. Okay. Assuming it's true. Um, let's see. So with regards to Metcalf's law, this is Whoops. back to this. Costs are quantifiable, but value is more subjective. So how might one project what the critical mass might be? How does one know when they have attained the critical mass to be successful? Metcalf's Law and Moore's Law have something in common. They begin with M. <laughs> Moore's Law has been numerically true since 1965, plus or minus, a factor of two. And Metcalf's Law has never been numerically evaluated. It's not that kind of law. And the, so when you say the value of a network grows as the square of the number of users, there's all sorts of problems with that statement, like what is value, and what is connected, and what's a user, and what is two. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you should, anyway, I've spent 25 years defending Metcalf's Law, and I continue to defend it. I believe it is exactly correct in every way. <laughs> so that on the, the front cover of Spectra magazine, which is, you know, a prominent journal, there's a recent article by three scientists saying, Metcalf's law is wrong and dangerous. And these, it was a brilliant paper. It didn't have any numerical evaluations of any laws. And they, their big improvement was to go from n squared to n log n. <laughs> I mean, the, if there is a bug with Metcalf's laws that eventually the value starts flattening and maybe starts heading down if you've ever gotten any spam. <laughs> but n log n doesn't turn down. It just keeps going up forever just like squared. So I didn't think that was worth Thanks. getting up to do. Just to, <laughs> if, if you want to revise Metcalf's law, I mean, revise it for Pete's sake. Just don't screw around with it on the margin. Well, back to, back to energy questions. I think it's a little safer there. But so. the critical masses, if you take Moore's law and you take Metcalf's law, the critical masses are coming down. And that explains social networking, blogs, Amazon, Absolutely. a lot of things. Right. The critical, if you do the math, which I've done extensively, the critical mass depends on the cost of connection and the value of connection and the ratio thereof. And both of those are heading in the right direction. When Metcalf's Law was first written, the most exciting thing you could do with the internet was log into a PDP-10. It's not a high value thing compared to YouTube, which is enormously valuable. And it costs a lot of money to do that, whereas today, it's so that critical mass has been heading down, 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 so. Okay. All right. So back to energy. What are the promising areas for energy transmission? So the, the grid is in a similar state to the telecom network prior to the internet. It's um, not much capacity, and it's very synchronous and fragile. So it's, it's right that it's on the list of things to do. The, one of the wrong things is, that of course, the, the grid has shown up in Washington recently and said, we are shovel ready. So give us you know, some significant fraction of a trillion dollars, and we shovel-ready will just build more of the stuff that we have, and that would be wrong. That would be like more sonnet, you know, just not a good idea. <laughs> so we need some research on what the smart grid, the modern grid in the future, and it won't come all at once, and there isn't so grand design, but we should put in place a process similar to the one that led to the internet. We need an architecture for the smart grid. As we were discussing earlier, it needs a, a control plane, it needs standards, uh, it needs storage, it needs a bunch of things that are reminiscent of the internet. It needs the internet, really. Maybe the internet is the control plane for the smart grid. Maybe we should give up on this AC thing and you know, go back to DC, as uh, Edison wanted us to do. There's a lot of change going to happen there, and this shovel-ready argument that's being well, it's like a lot of this stuff going on. It's just bogus. Okay, so one last question about energy here. So how about distributed energy production? So 
so the production side, instead of big power plants, 100 million solar roofs. So questioning if consolidation isn't the enemy of innovation. Well, the internet has the, the answer to this question. So it's gonna be, that's one of the problems with going, building the shovel-ready grid is that it's organized around. They use the word distribution in a funny way. We use the word distributed computing, distributed. What they mean is you build a great big coal plant and then you distribute <laughs> the electricity out to everybody. And clearly we're gonna have distributed nuclear and we're gonna have solar on the roof and distributed wind. And that's why the grid has to be a lot like the internet. It has to be symmetrical, two-way, like the, the energy. You know, the big debate about how symmetrical your local cable network is, 27 meg down and 12 baud up, something like that. <laughs> So the grid has to be more symmetrical and be, because of this distributed. So distributed, if the internet is any guide, we're gonna build a distributed energy network. And the current shovel-ready smart grid as it stands is not ready for that. Okay, all right. Well, thank you for great answers. I think we left a few, but um, I think we have time to probably chat some more. So We're gonna, John's here to tell us? Yeah, absolutely. I, I just wanted to, uh, first of all, just get everyone to give a round of applause to Bob and Kathy for a wonderful night. <laughs> Kathy, I want to thank you for doing a wonderful job for everything you did, uh, both preparing for tonight and actually carrying on this conversation. It was terrific to have you here. And Bob... Thank you so much. Uh, Bob has done a tremendous amount for the museum just today. He did a lunch today. He did a, uh, a session with Cisco engineers right here in this room and then this session tonight. And it's just been wonderful to have you here and be so generous with your time. Uh, it's fascinating to hear Bob talk about the lessons from the internet and applying those to the energy problems of today and tomorrow. And we were talking about this a little bit today. And Bob said, you know, I call this applied history. And I thought that was a wonderful phrase because it, it not only applies to what you're doing, Bob, it also applies to what we try to do here at the museum every day to apply the lessons of the past and look a little bit into the future and think about how those things fit together. And I want to thank you for doing something else for us because I would call part of what you do applied optimism. You are a, a relentlessly optimistic person whose accomplishments by virtue of both talent and optimism have changed so many things, and I think applied optimism is a value that you bring not only to the museum, but to everything you do, and we want to thank you for that. So we have a slight, a small gift for both of you. This is a, uh, a, a beautiful book of photography by uh, a photographer named Mark Richards who came into the collection and took very close up, very beautiful artistic photos of many of the things that are in visible storage and will be in the exhibit next year. So. I'd like to present these to you with our thanks tonight for everything you did. Please welcome them and thank them again, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks for being here tonight.